Welcome to this edition of the Doorstep Podcast. I'm your co-host, Tatiana Serafin. Nicholas Gvozdiev will join us next time. Today, we're speaking with Joseph Marks, cybersecurity expert from the Washington Post, who will be talking to us about cybersecurity, hacktivism, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and the Olympics. Uh, before we start, though, I wanted to mention next week, February 8th, 6 p.m., is our next book talk with Peter S. Goodman, Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World. It's an excellent read. Join us. Uh, you can go to the Carnegie Council website for more information on how to register and also follow us on Twitter to join the conversation. Thank you so much, Joe, for coming on to uh, the Doorstep podcast. Um, I've heard so much uh, about what is hacktivism these days, and we're going to mm -hmm. get into that. But before we do, I want to start out with, because, you know, all around the internet, all around uh, being reported is the issue of cybersecurity. You know, and when we hear of a cybersecurity attack, we normally associate the perpetrator to be some sort of a bad actor who's trying to get money, um, who's trying to disrupt the system for personal gain. Um, and a personal anecdote, uh, my college was uh, hacked um, in the fall um, in, for ransomware. And so, you know, it's real, it's with us. And, and the more I tell my story, the more I hear an elementary school being hacked or, you know, a not-for-profit being hacked. Um, so there's this whole big, you know, topic of cybersecurity and hacking um, that's out there and CEOs have mentioned it as the primary concern. Um, uh, the World Economic Forum said that cybersecurity, it's all about cybersecurity. I know you've covered it for many, many years. Um, what, where are we today with the idea of it? You know, why has it become so big um, as, as a concept? And then, and then I'll take it to hacktivism. But I, I think we need to start with, with cybersecurity. You know, it's having a, a moment, right? It's a number one threat by both politicians and CEOs and certainly personal experience. Um, what is going on? Why now? What is the moment right now? Can you give us the context? So cybersecurity and hacking is essentially having such a big moment right now because the internet is having a huge moment right now. You know, the internet, go 20, 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't designed with the idea of hacking in mind. It wasn't designed to be the world wide web that all of us basically live on for most of each day. Um, security wasn't built into it to begin with. And so it's all sort of put together with, you know, sticky tape and string. And now we've reached a point where not only our daily lives, and our work and our relationships and you know the way we talk to our, our mothers and our spouses and everyone else is mediated through the internet, but uh, government and a lot of the most critical infrastructure in the world runs through some kind of network system. And that stuff, just the, the security of those things has never really caught up with the networking of those things. And so when that happens, you're going to find people who either because it's a government that sees a national interest in disrupting these connections, or because they're criminals who see a profit motive in disrupting these connections, or because as we're going to get to the hacktivists see a uh, political reason to uh, disrupt these connections, they're going to do it. That's so interesting. Um that you bring up this idea of governments looking at it to, to be disruptive. Um, we have the Beijing Olympics coming mm -hmm. up. Uh, our opening ceremonies are Friday. I've been reading that athletes are, you know, might be protesting, but that's a physical kind of protest. But when we're talking about cyber, that's not really seen. And yet it touches so many people. And, and people are saying that, you know, the cybersecurity that that there's this idea that China or perhaps Russia is really interested in having cyber attacks um, against either the West, uh, the US in particular. And when we hear at the, at the doorstep, we talk about how it's gonna impact our day-to-day -day lives um, because they don't like the fact that we're standing up in protest. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you see that um, becoming and creating more awareness at the doorstep, at my doorstep, um, and, mm -hmm. and how can we at the doorstep or you know, the day-to-day -day Americans protect ourselves? Well, when you look at the Olympics, there are a couple of different things going on there. One is the question of 
big nation state backed attacks that are trying to disrupt it in some way. That happened in 2018, very nearly disrupting the opening games. Uh, there have been, a, the US has indicted um, several Russian government backed hackers for you know, big hacks that disrupted um, the entry system, almost just uh, took down a whole bunch of computers, almost disrupted the games. Could have been, you know, big, big media moment on the world stage if it hadn't been uh, responded to very quickly. The chances of that are somewhat less this year, basically just because of geopolitics, right? It's taking place in Beijing. The uh, worst offenders are Russia, which doesn't really want to offend China right now. China, which isn't going to disrupt its own Olympics and Iran and North Korea, both of which don't really want to embarrass China on the world stage. Is there going to be um, some kind of hacktivist activity? For example, you, you mentioned a lot of um, protests and don't happen in China right now. Uh, you could certainly see hacktivists trying to embarrass companies that are sponsoring the Olympics. We've seen things like that in the past. Uh, and you'll almost certainly see uh, espionage backhacking by Beijing of pretty much anyone who shows up there, athletes, journalists, dignitaries, anytime you've got a big event like the Olympics, like the UN General Assembly, like Davos, you know, a whole bunch of important people getting together in one place, you can almost guarantee that someone's going to be listening in from someone's government. Um, so that's two sides, I think, uh, and different goals, right? So the goal of um, uh, Russia or uh, in Iran, which, as you mentioned, don't want to irritate China, but say they were um, going to get in, is their state interest, is a national interest, versus hacktivist and their goals. And, and I'm really curious, and it, it's a term that's been around for a long time. And uh, the Washington Post last year called 2021 the year of the hacktivist. You know, mm -hmm. um, there were uh, many in the US, especially, a lot of activity around outing um, January 6 perpetrators mm -hmm. um, in exposing some of the conservative platforms. Um, and yet, it seems to me that hacktivism in particular has been under the radar, even though it's been around for decades, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, can you? kind of take us back to what is hacktivism? Um, pure, de simple definition, how it's done and who's doing it. So hacktivism is essentially, it is, it's activism online, right? It's, it's a way of protesting through the internet. And there was a real kind of 1.0 moment for hacktivism in the early 2010s. You had groups like Anonymous, groups like Wolzec that would disrupt websites, they disrupt the, disrupted the US Senate website, they disrupted um, some Sony systems at one point. Um, that was a really big moment that kind of petered out eventually for a couple of reasons, partly because a lot of those guys got arrested. It turned out the FBI was very good at seeing what they were doing and perhaps better than they were. To a somewhat lesser extent, uh, companies started to protect their systems a little bit better. You know, the, the awareness of cyber attacks got a little bit better in the private sector. There weren't as many opportunities for it. There's kind of a, has been a resurgence in 2021, uh, which was really interesting. Some of that probably had to do with the political moment. I mean, obviously you mentioned January 6th. You, you know, we've been in a very tumultuous political climate for quite a while. Um, you know, then that resulted in a handful of pretty significant breaches at um, social media sites frequented by the far right, Gab, Parler, um, on one of the major web hosting platforms that is used by a lot of far right websites. Whether that sticks around or not uh, is unclear. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens this year. Now, your point about hacktivists getting arrested. Um, so it's not legal, right? I mean, when we talk about protest and protest movements, and I'm a big advocate of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of protest, that's protected. You know, you, you go out there and you get your... Um, you know, uh, license to be on the street and, you know, you can protest, right, in physical person, right? And we've seen a lot of those, obviously, over the last couple of years in the political context. But when you talk about hacktivism, that's not legal, correct? Correct. And, you know, this gets to a larger thing about hacking in general. A lot of this happens in a very ethically dubious area. That, that's true, certainly what nation states do to each other. Uh, for their own national interests, but it's certainly true of hacktivists too. You know, something on the edge of hacktivism like WikiLeaks. A lot of people are probably 
supportive of WikiLeaks uh, when they were uh, bringing transparency to a lot of US government operations, the State Department cables, um, military operations in Afghanistan, probably less happy when they were posting you know, information from the DNC that helped disrupt the 2020 election. The, the same is true uh, if you look at um, some of these international movements. We're going to talk uh, in a little bit about what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. One of the bigger things that's happening is this group in Belarus called Cyber Partisans, Belarus, a, a very close Russian ally. Um, this group has been around for a while, has attempted to pester President Lukashenko there, um, claims to have stolen a lot of information that could be embarrassing for him and for his government and for uh, the people with a lot of money there. More recently, you know, as Russian troops have been building up on the Ukrainian border, they claim to have uh, gotten into the computer systems running the Belarusian railways, disrupted them, say that they will be able to disrupt the movement of Russian troops uh, as part of Ukrainian operations. You know, we in the West who believe that Russian invasion of Ukraine is a, a very bad thing, maybe very supportive of that. What they do next, who knows? It might be something we're less supportive of. In this particular case, it seems like they were somewhat sloppy and uh, disrupted ticket sales and disrupting uh, the, the lives of regular Belarusian citizens. That's not great. It's sort of in this ethically dubious area. And I think that's an important um, statement that the there is a threat of hacktivism to the day-to-day -day citizens, both uh, you know as here and if it happens abroad, um, because personal information can be exposed, um, or in this case, you know people were stranded on the railway because um, you know the as you said the BCP the activists um, took over the railways and disrupted the train lines. Um, you know, and it's illegal. So it's illegal, it could potentially mm -hmm. hurt people. Um, so where does that fall in terms of how governments are responding or managing or, you know, here in the US, you know, how is the government responding to hacktivists? Um, they responded pretty significantly to that 1.0 moment that I talked about. There were, there were a fair number of arrests. Um, in terms of what's happened more recently with the breaches at Gab and Parler and so forth, there haven't, to my knowledge, been any significant arrests yet. That could change. Um, this is something that the, the government takes very seriously. Um, the FBI has built up a very large cyber division to this point. Most of that is focused on more traditional cyber crime, um, but certainly, which, which has been growing substantially over the last decade and has become, you know, one of the, the largest focuses the FBI has, but certainly that can be focused on hacktivism as well. Um, when we're looking at hacktivists, <laughs> I mean, who are they typically? Uh, you know, is there a profile that, you know, you when you're looking at it, do, that you cover, that you're finding? Um, you know, are they younger? Are they, I mean, who, who are they? How do, how do they come about it? You know, how, how do you even become a hacktivist? It's sort of everyone. I mean, a lot of things are, they, they, they run the gamut. Uh, a lot of systems that they attack are just sort of lowest hanging fruits. You don't really even need a whole lot of technical knowledge. You, you need to be willing to kind of skirt the law a little bit. You need to be willing to do a little bit of web research to figure out what you can do. And you need to you know spend some time online and you know get involved in these collectives. There's a great uh, Wired article that came out just earlier today about there's a recent outage in the North Korean internet for what it's worth, what the North Korean internet is, that uh, the, uh, the Kim Jong-un regime had claimed seemed to be launched by a foreign nation state. Um, there's a guy who claims that he just sort of did it himself. He was piqued at uh, North Korea. He did it in his pajamas. What do you believe? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I don't know. I have no, no, no great insights. <laughs> um, but that's a great point. Um, how can we tell, um, you know, if it is a state-sponsored attack, as in the case in, uh, with Ukraine? You know, on January 14th, a lot of Ukrainian um, government websites in particular were um, hacked into with messages scrawled across the front saying, beware, uh, be afraid, in Ukrainian and in Polish. Um, people assumed it was Russia. But how can you tell if it was a state entity or hacktivism? It, you know, is there a line you know, in, in, that, in the world of cybersecurity and, and, and how we follow things? 
That's one of the tough, toughest things that the U.S. government and um, cybersecurity research firms have been trying to deal with over the last decade is this question of attribution, less so for hacktivism and more so for nation state backed attacks, because it was pretty easy to say a decade or more ago, hey, no one knows who's doing what on the internet, anything could be anyone. It's really in the US government's interest now when uh, you know large companies are being attacked by nation state adversaries who have, uh, who have uh, very significant skills and are creating you know, real uh, you know, geopolitical fallout. It's important for them to be able to say, yes, this was, uh, to take an example, um, yes, this was Russia who was behind the solar winds attack that, that um, compromised lots and lots of information from multiple federal government agencies and large critical infrastructure firms um, to say, yes, this was Russia that was behind the 2018 Olympics hacks. Yes, this was Russia that hacked the DNC. And, and there have been other instances where they blamed, for instance, um, North Korea for the attack on Sony uh, pictures in 2014, China, Iran for various other things. You know, you want to have some, uh, you want to be able to both say that and prove that and be able to respond to it with indictments, with sanctions, with various other things. Um, the US government has gotten much better at that. Uh, there has, however, been some lag in them showing their work. One of the issues is that um, sometimes there are technical indicators that they can use that prove this pretty well. A lot of times they're relying on uh, foreign intelligence gathered by the NSA, perhaps by the CIA, that prove this and they don't really want to show that because they don't want to show what they got or how they got it. And so that's one of the things that uh, is has been an issue for the past decade and is going to be one for the next decade, being able to uh, name and shame and prove and have it believed on the world stage. Again, mostly for nation state backed attacks. Um, that nation state backed attack seem to be a, seems to be a big playbook um, that Putin has in his pocket. Um, what can, you know, and, and I think as the Russia Ukraine tensions escalate, I think a lot of people are expecting Putin to use that playbook and to hmm. do, you know, more cyber attacks either in Western Europe or even the US. You know, going back to my first, and maybe there's no answer, but you know, my question at the beginning, um, is there anything on a day-to-day -day level that we can do to protect ourselves against these uh, or potential cyber attack? Um, should we be expecting a cyber attack? I mean, is, is this something that we need to start talking and be being more prepared about? Um, should we be expecting one? We should definitely be preparing for one. You know, the the, the greatest fear over the past decade or so is that there would be an attack on the US from you know one of these highly capable nation state adversaries, probably Russia, it would really disrupt critical infrastructure in some way, right? It would shut down the energy grid, it would stop the water from flowing, it would um, stop, it would uh, disrupt the water treatment system so that we couldn't be sure that our water was safe to drink. It would tie up transportation in some way. That hasn't happened yet. It kind of has happened with cyber criminals, most of whom are operating out of Russian territory. The biggest example of that being the Colonial Pipeline hack last year that disrupted uh, gas supplies for a short period of time in the southeastern United States. That wasn't the Russian state. It was Russian cyber criminals. It was cyber criminals mostly operating out of Russia with the kind of tacit approval of the Russian state. The Russian state could do a lot more than that. The question is, will they? And, and the biggest concern is that, you know, say Ukrainian tensions escalate, say Russia invades, the West responds with increasingly severe sanctions that really disrupt the Russian economy, and Russia wants to do something short of military action that will hurt the United States and Western allies in order to pay them back for this. A cyber attack on critical infrastructure is a pretty easy way to do that. So all of these concerns have been rising up for the, the past decade, they could come to fruition, you know, if things escalate. And, and that's the thing that US government officials are, are most worried about right now. It seems to me everyone is so focused on troop movements. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't, I'm more, I'm more scared about the cyber um, potential and the cyber attacks, you know. Can, well, to put, I mean, to, to put things in, in perspective, like cyber is really scary because you don't see it. It happens all of a sudden. And it's the kind of thing that can, you know, reach across an ocean and really disrupt our lives here. But to put it in perspective, there is no definitive instance yet in which a cyber attack has killed anyone. There are, there are a couple of iffy instances where, you know, cyber crimes probably disrupted hospital service to a point that, that someone died. But there, there's no real clear incident where a cyber attack definitely killed someone. There's been a lot of economic fallout from a cyber attack, but you know th this is not on the level of you know Russian troops you know rolling across the border and uh, you know soldiers shooting at each other yet. True, um, and but the cyber attacks in the Belarus case, let's come back to that, yeah. could potentially prevent the, the mm -hmm. uh, soldiers from getting to yeah. where they need to be. Um, if they are kept up and they're not kind of tamped mm -hmm. down, which gets back to my point, you know, how do you identify who these people are, whether they be hacktivists, as in the Belarusian case, or, you know, somebody or a cyber criminals, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, operating under the, you know, um, opportunities available in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it because it's anonymous, it's so hard to kind of put a name to it, you know. In, in usual protest movements or other, you know, activity or any or troop movement activities, you can see the people, right? Like I just saw this great, you know, cause we have all the satellite imagery. You can actually see where the troops are, right? With, with all the satellite imagery. Um, you can't, you can't see who the, these hackers are. And so, you know, this is gonna be, I think difficult to, to create a move, any sort of movement around. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, one way to think about it is that, uh, you know, cyber is less of a thing in itself these days than it is. I mean, just like the internet has invaded all of our lives in, you know, every way. It's, it's how we communicate. It's how we find recipes. It's, it's how we find entertainment. It's invaded warfare, too, and it's invaded most elements of diplomacy. So, you know, it's warfare today is if you if, when you have a nation like Russia that's highly cyber capable, almost guaranteed to be what people call hybrid warfare, right? You know, they won't just be rolling in in tanks. They're going to be rolling in, in if, if this happens, they'll be rolling in in tanks and they will be disrupting the communications networks of Ukrainian officials and government. And, you know, they will be launching disinformation operations inside Ukraine. Like there will be a cyber element of pretty much any military operation going forward. And, you know, running parallel to that, you know, there's gonna be a cyber element of pretty much any resistance operation going forward, right? You know, the, if, if the French resistance were uh, around today, they, they would be trying to attack Nazi websites and stuff, you know? Like th this is just an element of how uh, war and protest and everything else happens now. Um, I'm glad you gave the example of um, attacking a website um, because I wanted to talk about some of the forms that um, this kind of cyber um, threats take or hacktivism takes. Um, one of it is certainly disrupting a website. Um, and for our audience, can you give some other examples of, of, of what, you know, the physicality, I know it's not physical because mm -hmm. the internet, but the physicality, like what, what do we see when we see an attack? Um, for hacktivism, what you often see, you see uh, disrupting websites. There's a thing called distributed denial of service, which is essentially, and this is one of the early, this goes back to, you know, what was happening in the, in the early 2010s, early 2000s. You, you basically flood a site with as much web traffic as you can so that it can no longer operate. Um, you also see people getting into and defacing websites. Um, in, in the case of the... Um, the, the attacks on Ukrainian computers have written down here somewhere. Uh, Ukrainian government computers and some industry computers uh, were defaced to read, uh, be afraid, expect the worst. Um, in the operation we all read about a couple of weeks ago, uh, you'll see defacements like that. Um, you certainly see hack and leak operations, which is what's been happening with um, Gab and Parler in these far right sites where you hack in just like 
um, you know, cyber criminals who are interested in gathering information from a company so that they can, you know, sell its data or sell people's personal information for identity theft. People going in, grabbing information and leaking it to embarrass people. Um, and you increasingly see, and this is a little bit of what we were seeing in uh, Belarus, is you'll see the tactics of ransomware gangs, you know? So, so ransomware is essentially you, you, you gain access to the networks of an organization, but instead of stealing all their data and leaking it, you lock it up, encrypt it, and then demand a ransom to unlock it. Well, a lot of times what you're seeing with um, hacktivist groups or even nation states is it looks like ransomware. They go in, they lock it up, but they aren't really interested in making money. They're interested in just disrupting the operations and shutting everything down, destroying the data, destroying the computer systems so that they can't operate it. Have there been <laughs> recently any success, like super successful hacktivist um, attack so that, you know, they took that data and they actually made their point and somebody changed their behaviors, you know, as opposed, you know, you know, in a, in a positive way. So not in something like in the, in the Gillers case, right? Mm -hmm. Like normal citizens were affected. Did it really affect the Russian activity on clear? Yes, they threatened to do more, but we don't know what's going to happen. You know, it, so it seems like, I don't know, was it a good thing? Did they achieve their goals? Is, are there any examples of hacktivism achieving the stated goals that you might know of? Honestly, no, none that occurred to me, you know, and, that, and that's what gets back to, uh, you know, it would be interesting to see, you know, some kind of hacktivist campaign that you could say was, you know, totally in the moral right and this was done, but that, that's not really how these things work. I, I can't think of an example offhand where, uh, you know, there's sort of a Robin Hood hacktivist uh, operation that, you know, really changed the world for the better. Yeah, I, w I was reading about it and it was, somebody said it's like having graffiti on a wall, which, mm. you know, is interesting maybe to, to think about and discuss, but might just be that, you know. Mm. Um, uh, in, and I'm really curious about this anonymous factor. Has anyone ever come out? I mean, aside from, you know, WikiLeaks and, and Julian Assange, has anybody ever kind of stood up and said, this is what I'm doing, you know, outed themselves or does this typically tend to be anonymous? Um, the, um, groups tend to uh, uh, take credit for things that they do, but in, in an anonymous fashion, right? You know, they're, uh, even the cyber partisans, the, the group in Belarus, have given a couple of interviews, but they, they, they do it by, you know, internet handles, not by actual names. Right. So it's that kind of the mask face that we think about. Yeah, the guy Fox about. face. Yeah, <laughs> Fox face. Um, well, thank you so much for explaining um, this something that I think we all need to be talking more about, um, whether it be protecting our own security or being aware of what's happening, um, the threat to us at a local level, a national level, an international level. And I'll be really curious to see what happens um, at the Olympics and the continuing Russia-Ukraine um, situation. Is there anything you're looking forward to in 2022 in this field? Um, you know, something that you know, we should be thinking more about that people aren't talking about. Oh boy, that's a, that's a really good question. The thing I'm mostly looking at is, uh, and this is what I spent a lot of my time covering, is the extent to which the federal government can get its act together to uh, better protect the nation against these sort of acts. I mean, one of the problems you run into is that there's an awareness of the danger of attacks from, from nation states and from criminals there's an interest among companies in protecting themselves but it doesn't really go up and down the chain. I mean, because um, uh, organizations have either because they have cyber insurance, because they that's going to cover certain losses, because they don't have the, the wherewithal to protect themselves, there's just not a real, um, many, many organizations remain far less protected than they ought to be. And a lot of what cyber criminals in particular are getting is just low hanging fruit. The federal government has been trying to change this in a sort of collaborative way, especially with a lot of the critical infrastructure sectors, you know, the, the energy companies, the dams, the, the agricultural uh, firms. Um, 
that hasn't worked so far. And in a lot of ways, the government's hands are kind of tied because they don't really have authorities to this point to, to, to force these changes. And Congress has not been great about getting its act together to give them those authorities. So whether either through cooperation or if we can get something through Congress to uh, grant more authorities to federal agencies to require certain changes, you know, can we better protect ourselves this year? That, that's the thing I'm probably looking at most. We'll be looking at it too and hope to have you back to comment on it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Doorstep, sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. For more, go to carnegiecouncil.org. Stay healthy and safe.